Welcome to the second lecture of uh, research methods. If you would recall from the previous lecture, we discussed research methodology, what it entails, what steps are, are involved in research methodology, and what is uh, included in research and how do you do go about it. And I think uh, a better way to learn about research methodology is to actually look at uh, review a complete case study. Uh, from its inception to research to analysis to documentation to final stages where we conclude the research. Uh, let's have a look at it um, and by reviewing a, a complete research uh, case study uh, we will be able to appreciate what we have learned in the first lecture. So the case study that I'm presenting here today is the, that of a household solid waste generation in Rawalpindi cantonment and Rawalpindi is a city um, in the most populous province of Pakistan, Punjab, and then the cantonment is the garrison part of the city. And this study was done by um, a student at the uh, um, National University of Sciences and Technology, NAST, and uh, by the name of Tiza Heather. And the study is, is, is primarily uh, the, an intellectual uh, property belonging to the student at NAST. And we are using uh, this, uh, with his permission, the case study as an illustration in this lecture. So, here's, here's the question, why study household solid waste generation in the first place? As I mentioned earlier, that enough, uh, uh, there are significant efforts involved in doing uh, research. And before you um, submit um, a proposal, commit to a project, you need to ask yourself, is it worth your time? Is it worth your while to study something? Uh, so here we ask the first question, why study household waste generation? In a city, and I think the the the, the follow-up question is: What benefits could the society draw from a study of household solid waste generation in the city of Rawalpindi? And the obvious answer to this thing is that if you uh, were to plan solid waste collection in a more efficient and proficient way in in the cities in Pakistan or anywhere else in the world, you really need to know how waste is generated, how much waste is generated what type of households generate what type of waste and once you have that information right, then you can go around and then start planning but in the absence of basic information of, of how waste is generated and, and in this particular case we are looking at solid waste generated at the household level not at the commercial level just the household level we need to really understand the waste generation rates um, and then when you're planning something for a city you really need to know the waste generation for that particular city rather than uh, learning something similar in a similar city that may be helpful, that may could be different, and may not be very useful for planning purposes. So, the uh, the task at hand for the student was to design a research plan, write a proposal, execute the research, um, and then uh, once the research is complete, uh, uh, perform uh, undertake documentation, write the thesis, and and then present research uh, to the peers and, and, and to, to the university. So. Let's work with this. Now, let me just give you a brief uh, background of solid waste um, as it uh, relates to household in Pakistan. Now, it's, it's a very unmanaged sector uh, of municipal services. Um, in, in a given year, Pakistan generates an estimate 48,000 tons of solid waste per day, of which almost 20,000 uh, tons of waste is, is generated in urban areas. Now, Pakistan uh, has a smaller uh, urban population, but if you look at the waste generated um, in urban areas, that is uh, significantly larger than the relative size of the urban population in Pakistan. Now, once that waste is generated, it is left to as, as litter or uh, it decomposes on, on streets um, uh, or empty lots or it, it's dumped in or burned in open, open areas. It's not treated properly, scientifically. And um, if, even if you burn solid waste, and, uh, incineration results in more air pollution, and and you would see that a lot of a large number of people have now got the breathing problems resulting from all sorts of different pollutions, uh, airborne uh, problems. Now, there is a significant uh, level of uh, uh, government uh, agencies involved in solid waste, but the reality is that not much is done on the street level. Um, even where, where administration exists and department exists for solid waste collection, uh, usually the service is irregular, um, inefficient, and inadequate. And then 
even when you collect solid waste uh, through regular municipal sources, the final disposal is still dubious, it's still problematic, it's burnt, it's dumped in, in non-engineered landfills, which further uh, pollutes groundwater and the like. So the reason I presented this picture to you is to make sure that, you, that I'm able to convey to you that understanding solid waste generation is a worthwhile topic. It, if you were to develop sound understanding of how solid waste is generated, um, you'll be able to do um, better planning through that information. And hence, this is useful. Um, this is a very useful study. Uh, it has a benefit for the society in general, and that's why we would like to undertake this research. So, um, if you were to look at the household level waste generation, in Pakistan, uh, waste generation rates uh, for solid waste uh, vary between uh, half a kilogram to 0.7 kilogram uh, per capita per day, which means that an average person in Pakistan generates roughly between 500 grams to 700 grams um, of household waste every day. And the, the uh, big cities like Karachi, um, it only is able to recover 50% of the 7,000 tons of solid waste generated every day. So again, it's a big problem. Um, well, half of the waste generated is collected and disposed of in, in some adequate manner. The rest is just left to decay and causes pollution and other environmental and health related problems. Now, in, in Pakistan, both formal and informal sectors have been involved in solid waste management. In formal sectors where you see uh, scavengers and, and, and and, and, and others collecting information, uh, sorry, collecting the, the, the solid waste from streets and then uh, looking for recyclables and selling those in the, in the secondary markets. And you also see formal uh, municipal trucks collecting solid waste. So uh, the, the problem is that uh, almost 60% of the solid waste um, that is in, in coming out of households is not recyclable. It's actually uh, vegetable and fruit residues and dust and dirt and residues from construction. So that is the, the major of the problem. Now moving forward, uh, the solid waste generation um, is seldom broken down into, into its various categories. Uh, and it has only been done for a select cities in Pakistan. Uh, when I say various categories, we need to know um, if you have uh, household waste coming out, how much of it is vegetable waste, how much of it is dust, how much of it is something else. right? So uh, you need to work on this. And even in those cities where you have some estimates available uh, for solid waste, you don't know those estimates for different socioeconomic groups. Uh, for instance, uh, is the solid waste generated by high income neighborhoods the same as low income neighborhoods? Do low income neighborhoods generate less solid waste than high income neighborhoods? And all sorts of these questions are largely unanswered in, in, in the Pakistani context. And if they are, the examples are very rare. So the ignorance about the fundamentals of waste generation in urban Pakistan uh, contributes to the lack of effective policy making uh, regarding solid waste management. And therefore, one needs to understand solid waste generation uh, at the household level better so that one can make better decision making. And remember the slides from uh, the last lecture where I said that informed decision making, uh, effective decision making, Effective policy making requires information, requires analysis, and therefore, if you were to one were to um, formulate policy regarding solid waste, one really has to know how much waste is generated, what are the socio -dem demographic uh, determinants of household waste generation um, in Pakistan. So, the first stage for the student was to develop a research proposal and uh, identify why uh, this topic should be studied and uh, um, how the improved uh, understanding of solid waste will um, contribute to improved management of household waste and um, will produce generation estimates, waste generation estimates uh, for the city uh, of Rawalpindi. And to the best of this, our understanding of the students' research, no such estimate ex estimates existed in the past. So what was the research methodology identified? And I would point you uh, to, to, the, uh, to the slide here. Now the literature review is where the student actually uh, went about and, and looked at the information available, um, uh, the studies done in the past, 
and then from that uh, review of studies and reports, um, determine some basic uh, information, some basic benchmarks, and then from there onwards went in and, and started scoping. And scoping was to identify uh, both in terms of space and in terms of, of time. Um, what neighborhoods would be studied because one student alone cannot study solid waste generation in the entire city uh, so then one has to really confine the study and in this case it was uh, confined to the garrison part of Rawalpindi city and then in temporal terms it wasn't supposed to be a year-long study it was just uh, studying uh, um, solid waste generation in a, in a select few neighborhoods for uh, 30 days or four weeks. So once the scoping was done, the next third stage here, so this is one, this is two, and the third stage was uh, data collection. Right? And the data collection, you really I have to identify sampling, what neighborhoods you would uh, identify, uh, and then once you have identified certain neighborhoods, how many households would be surveyed in those neighborhoods, and once you have identified households, you have to make sure that there is no systematic bias in identifying those households, for instance, you don't uh, select households based on convenience, but you have to make sure that there's some certain randomness uh, in, in your in your uh, sampling. Um, from there onwards, you have to design the survey questionnaire because you would like to solicit information both about the, the, the demographics of the households and also the, the, uh, the solid waste generation characteristics of the household. Once you have designed the survey questionnaire and you have pre-tested it, you execute the survey, that is you take the questionnaire, you administer it to the households and ask them to fill it up and at the same time you start collecting waste from those households for the four week period and then perform uh, analysis of that waste. You weigh it, you categorize it and then weigh it again for each category of waste collected and from that process onwards you create a database, all of the information to households. Uh, demographic information, number of people, what type of housing, what type of water supply, what type of sanitation facilities exist in the household, um, how many people were there in the household, what kind of education levels, what kind of income levels, and if you don't ask about income, can you impute income from uh, other information such as how many cars they own, how many motorbikes they own, what is the size of the housing unit, so that it could serve as a proxy for income if income is not collected uh, as, as, a, as a specific explicit question in your questionnaire. So once you have taken that information to the survey questionnaire, you bring it back and, and then you create a database and a database will be created in your software. You may uh, use any of the softwares that I mentioned earlier, it could be Excel, Stata, SAS, and R. and remember that we are using R in our example. So a, a database was created and then well, once the database was created, the next step was data analysis and in that data analysis, uh, that uh, the relationships between solid waste generated and the household's demographic attributes were linked and studies and studied and correlations were studied and dependencies were studied. Finally, the last stage is documentation in which the whole process was, uh, research was documented. So the next step is to look at the scheduling. You have identified a plan, research plan, and one of the key elements of research plan is to come up with a schedule and on your screens you will be able to see a schedule where all the tasks that need to be performed are highlighted um, on the left and um, the, the scheduling is mentioned um, on, the, on the right side. So if you look at it here, these are the tasks uh, right here that needed to be performed and then here's the timeline of events and you could see what activities were supposed to be done at what time and all of this is highlighted here and this is the way and the entire research plan was actually um, uh, mapped out in advance. So you know that you would begin, you will be doing literature review in these four weeks and, and then selection of neighborhoods uh, in, in these two weeks, data collection in this month, and data analysis is here, and then report writing and conclusions. Also critical is the, the information about the budgeting. The same tasks are identified here, right here, and then the budget amount, and you would notice that I've been a little uh, sneaky here, I've ta taken the budget amounts uh, and I've hidden them and then in the description of how those works would be done. So this is again scheduling and budgeting is uh, part and parcel of the research process. So let's move to re literature review and in this particular case, in this case of solid waste generation rate study, why literature review is important 
and what actually is, is, is achieved in the literature review. Now, the previous research allows you to see what others have done, how they have done it, how they have done similar research. For example, um, in this type of research, you would like to know how many households you would like to survey. Like, should you be talking to a thousand households, or ten thousand households, or a hundred thousand households? And then the literature review allows you to see how this research has been done in the past. So in this case, I think the literature review suggested that anywhere between 50 and 100 households uh, would be sufficient because others uh, published research in, in that great journals where uh, journals of quality, uh, household waste generation rates have been studied using a sample size of uh, 100 households. Um, so that's where uh, you, you get some benefits of uh, reviewing the literature. You also learn about analytical methods, what kind of statistical techniques, what kind of survey questionnaires were, in, were executed, and how that data was analyzed. This all comes from literature reviews. Now, this also prevents you from reinventing the wheel. If someone else has done the same study just a year and a half ago, um, and you didn't know about it, if, when you do a good literature review, you will learn, that, oh, there's no need to do this study. Exactly what you had planned has already been done. And this allows you to do something new, that something that is different from what has been done in the past. Or maybe that you just say, okay, I'm going to do something very different. And I'm, I'm going to study solid waste. I'll study something else. So you would make that conclusion once you are aware what others have done. And literature review is the key point that allows you to do that. And lastly, and most importantly, you use literature review to identify gaps in the literature. That is, what has others, what others have studied, and what gaps they may have left in their research that you can exploit and you can study in great detail. The resources to conduct literature review are now abundant. When I was studying, uh, when I was a graduate student, internet was still not that uh, common and the resources available were really limited and you really had to make your way to the library and in the dead of winter in Toronto that was a very pressing difficult task to do but now with the with the uh, internet you have access to um, thousands literally thousands of journals articles and with Google Scholar you have access to unpublished work ref, uh, working papers as well and Google is also working on digitizing a few more old books that uh, may be of relevance but are out of print and then they will be now available through Google Books. You can also use certain indices to do research. Now, I have listed two here, um, Web, of, Web of Knowledge and ProQuest and also EconLit. These are basically indices, research indices that you can search and you can identify research papers that have been published in the past using keywords. So if you are interested in solid waste but you're only interested in solid waste coming from households and you're only interested in solid waste coming from households in South Asia, you enter these key terms in, in something like the Conlet and you will get a few papers that have been published and that meets the search criteria that we've just highlighted. So use these research indices um, uh, excessively because that is your first step in identifying literature that exists on the problems that you're studying. Now, Web of Knowledge uh, and ProQuest and Econlet are available by subscription. These are fairly expensive uh, research indices, but I think Google Scholar is, has filled that gap. You can actually um, take the first step of looking for literature by going on Google Scholar and see what uh, working papers and published work is available um, to you. And if your university subscribe to certain journals, uh, you may be able to link to those papers and with, download the actual papers um, provided that your university is subscribing and you have an IP address that comes from the same university. Once you have that information um, and you have um, created uh, and read a uh, few papers, um, then you need to archive that information in, 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 a, in a specific, more methodological manner. And there's something that we call annotated, annotated bibliography. Whereas uh, in, 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 in annotated bibliography, basically a list of uh, uh, papers, but it also includes your comments. After you have read a paper, uh, you record your own uh, observations uh, and, and your own conclusions and inferences you have drawn from the paper. There are software now available that actually do this job for you. There's one called Reference Manager and, and Node, and there's a freeware called Zotero that works with a uh, uh, an Internet Explorer type of software um, and, and you can actually use Zotero uh, to similarly collect information, archive it 
and then create an annotated bibliography from it. And when you're writing a paper, you need all this information readily available for you to use so that you can source material uh, as you write. So how did, uh, so after that, doing the literature review and identifying um, previous research, the next step is to proceed and uh, do the data collection. So uh, the first thing is sampling, uh, how many households to collect. So as I mentioned, um, the literature suggested that about 100 households would be sufficient, and those households were selected in six different neighborhoods. And um, so the, the goal was to, after identifying the neighborhoods, mobilize the community uh, and um, get some community leaders who could actually uh, talk to the, to the neighborhood uh, households and, and inform them that there's a study being done and it would be worth their while, the households, uh, it is in the interest of the households, so they should participate in that study. And that's called community mobilization, because if you knock on somebody's door and say, I'm doing this research, um, and it may be beneficial to you, people may end up uh, shutting their door, doors on you. So you really have to work with the community leaders, uh, mobilize the community, make them aware of the research, uh, make them aware of what benefits would be drawn from them, what, what could, how would that research be beneficial to them, and then you have a fairly good, decent chance of uh, getting some data from, um, from service. So once the uh, community was mobilized and the new community leaders were, were, were involved in the project, um, uh, data were collected. So out of those six neighborhoods, it was um, um, the survey design and through literature review, we, we found that it would be better if we have two neighborhoods from low-income areas, uh, two from mid-income neighborhoods, and two high-income neighborhoods, so that we are able to study waste generation rates in low, mid, and high-income neighborhoods. Um, again, um, from the literature review, we, we suggested that 20 households per neighborhood would be sufficient, so 20 times 6, we have 120 households in the study. And um, again, making these decisions become easier if you have re reviewed the literature because you could see that other experts have done something in the same way and then you can actually adopt their methodology that has pr produced good quality research. So once you have identified the neighborhoods, once you have identified the households within the neighborhoods, and that's all sampling, um, then you proceed with uh, survey questionnaire design. Uh, and uh, and one, one last thing that I would like to mention in this particular study, the selection of households was quasi-random. That is not entirely random, and it's sometimes not possible to do a totally random sample within within a uh, neighborhood. And it was done through uh, the community leaders and what neighbor households they identified. So you s simply cannot make this assumption that the sample sample was completely random. And, and if it sounds a little alien, don't don't be scared at this stage, because in the lecture on uh, sampling. I will explain in great detail what do we mean by random sample, what do we mean by quasi-random, or a sample of convenience. But at this stage, um, I think it would be sufficient to say that the sample was a sample of convenience. So there were three questionnaires that we administered. Um, it was the household demographic and housing questionnaire, where households were quizzed about the, the size of the household and education levels and, and other uh, endowments such as cars and whatnot and also the housing characteristics you know, how big is the house how many water how many bedrooms how many washrooms and so on and so forth there was also a, a survey of neighborhood characteristics that was undertaken to figure out how many dump sites are there uh, is uh, waste being dumped legally or is waste is uh, being dumped in open lots and, and the like and lastly, um, a survey was done to categorize solid waste. Of the solid waste that was collected was not only weighed, after weighing the solid waste, it was broken down into pieces, and then it was um, uh, each and every category of solid waste was uh, weighed separately. The survey questionnaires were pre-tested on a small sample and then were executed on the entire population. So here is an example of uh, uh, community mobilization. Uh, what you see on the on the screen are uh, uh, copies of two letters. On this, on the left side here, uh, this is a letter that was sent by the student to households, and and they were informed that there is a survey being designed, and their participation is sought in the survey. Uh, 
this is on your left hand side and on the right hand side you would see that the a letter was sent from the university and was co-signed by the student as well as the um, uh, the, the planning authorities in the city and in this case it was the cantonment board and their executive officer was also involved and they signed it and they asked the neighborhood um, and the households that please collaborate this is a study that would improve solid waste management in their communities and hence um, uh, it serves two purposes it authenticates uh, the surveyors bona fide people are able to trust because you're giving away something that you may probably would like to not uh, would have not others see what your waste is and therefore it's, it's something private um, so in order to gain trust of the community you really have to do it in a proper way you have to involve the community you have to involve the government you have to involve the agencies that are involved and you have to convince the community that this survey would be benef beneficial for them or else you would not have a good response rate and here's the uh, copy of the survey instrument. Notice that the survey instrument is in Urdu, uh, which is the most uh, understood language in Pakistan. And um, it could have been in English because the high income neighborhoods, you could easily have executed a survey questionnaire in English. But having the same questionnaire, it guarantees that uh, everyone in the, in the population um, in the neighborhoods was able to read and write Urdu. And therefore, the questionnaire was designed um, it's primarily in Urdu. There was an English copy available. If somebody would have asked, an English version would have been provided to them. And the questions you ask is, uh, who is the respondent? Uh, what is the relationship of the respondent uh, with the head of the household, their address, the respondent's age, the respondent's gender, male or female? How, how, what is the literacy level of the respondent? Uh, how many people in the household? And then you break down the household members into males, females, and kids or children, and, and, and so on and so forth. Now, in order to do this survey, you really need people who can actually collect data and, and collect waste and then sort it. So uh, the, it was decided that the um, help of sanitary workers, people who are in the, in, involved in the business of waste collection, in the in the neighborhoods would be would be involved in this this research so um, five sanitary workers were involved and selected and they were involved in collecting this waste and they were also in, given training uh, on how to collect waste um, how to categorize it how to store it how to do, um, deal with it now each uh, survey uh, each uh, sanitary worker was given a select number of households uh, to collect data from And here in this graphic, you would see that the sanitary workers were brought to the university and they were properly trained as to how you collect it and uh, this waste, make sure that you are not end up uh, uh, suffering from some contamination and some safety guidelines and, and, and instrument training. How do you weigh the waste uh, was provided to the, to the workers. And this is key because if any error is made in data collection, that error becomes your error because it would stay in your data analysis. If the instrument, if the weighing instrument is not handled correctly, if the waste is not separated and, and then after categorizing it's not weighed correctly, if a wrong set of weigh, uh, weighing instrument is used, if that weighing instrument that is not sensitive at say capturing something as light as 500 grams and the person is using it to, to a very large weighing instrument to, to weigh something small, something light, then that would create an error in your, in your, in your data. And therefore, it's important that you train your workers, those uh, numerators who go out and collect information. And here's the example of uh, uh, people being trained. So the survey was executed over four weeks. Again, um, it was informed by the literature review, that is the literature review advisors gave us this, this idea that other studies have been done for four weeks or less and most studies were done for a week or at best 10 days and there were almost no example of a larger study except one. Um, so each day sanitary workers would collect bags from households and then sort the solid waste and weigh it and then the, the information was recorded on a form and that form was brought to the student and the student would then create a database out of it and that's how the database was generated. Now, please note that the solid waste disposal was not in, in scope of the study and hence the final disposal was done as it would have been done uh, in regular process.
now comes the stage where we actually have collected the information and now we develop the database. Right? So all those uh, ways that was collected, sorted and weighed was brought into, uh, was recorded in a paper format and then it was transferred into a computerized database. And then once the solid waste uh, weighing da data were collected and, and put in a database, it was merged with the information on households, right? Because we know now how much waste is being collected from each household, but you need to know how many people live in that household, how many people are male, female, children, uh, and size of the housing unit, and so on and so forth. So the two databases, the household demographic data and the data on solid waste was merged and before any analysis was done. So each row in the database represented the daily solid uh, waste characteristics of the individual household. And then you have to create a meta, metadata or data dictionary, and I'll give you an example here. Uh, you notice that in the survey questionnaire, we asked the question if the respondent was male or female. Right? Now, if you, collect, if you store this information in a database, that information would be stored as one or zero. And let's say by mistake or by, by just uh, tradition, you name that variable gender. Now, the gender could be male or female, but if you record it as one or zero, how would you know six months from now or a year from now um, if one means male or one means female? Right? Unless you have a data dictionary where the data dictionary tells you explicitly, by the way, the variable gender, one stands for me, female and zero stands for male, there's no other way of knowing this. And therefore, I urge you very strongly that when you're doing data analysis, first prepare the data in a, in a dictionary where you define each and every variable, how you collected it, and if there is information such as the categorical variable one or zero, you note down if one represents male or female so that six months, six years down the road, if you need to look at this data, you would have no problem recalling how the data were collected and what one stands for and what zero stands for. We used uh, a software called Stata to, to do this uh, research, but again, um, we, as I'm suggesting that this should have been done in R, which is a freeware and a very efficient way of doing it. And in this course, most of our work will be done in R. The first step in data analysis is the preliminary data analysis. In the preliminary data analysis, you look at basic descriptive statistics. Uh, if you recall from the first lecture, um, I mentioned something called the measures of central tendency. The average weight, the average height, the average uh, waste generated, the average number of household members, the average number of children in households. All of these are measures of central tendency and we, we did the first stage, uh, the, the, the descriptive statistics were calculated. Also some graphics were done, histograms, um, which show the distribution of data um, were also collected. And I'll show you the examples of histograms as well. Another um, um, tests were done, uh, tests where uh, the association between two variables would be tested using something called a chi-square test. And at this stage of the game, you really don't need to know what chi-square stands for. Uh, when the time comes and we are doing the hypothesis testing, I have a lecture or two on chi-square and z test and, and other tests that explain all this. Now. Once you have done the preliminary uh, data analysis and done the descriptive analysis, the next stage is the econometric or uh, analysis or model building. And in, in this project, the econometric analysis means that you are interested in explaining the variation in solid waste generation at the household level as a dependent variable and using the household's characteristics as an explanatory variable. Now, in, in simple language, uh, what I just said meant the, as follows. Do larger households generate more waste? Do high income households on average generate more waste? Do households with children generate more waste? Right. And so on and so forth. All these are hypotheses, all these are questions, and the way to answer those is to run a regression model where you have a dependent variable and then a set of explanatory variables that you introduce and then uh, find the answers for those. And usually the way we express a regression model is we, we, we write it like this, where we say that y is a function and f stands for a function of uh, certain variables. And we are saying y is a function of x, uh, xi and ni, where yi is the solid waste of type i 
uh, any solid waste generated on a per daily basis in by a household and xi is the vector of household attributes um, such as how big is the household how many males how many females what is the size of the uh, housing unit is it 10,000 square feet or 200 square feet or 500 square feet and ni stands for neighborhood attributes um, and neighborhood attributes um, um, stand for is there a proper uh, dumping facility waste dumping facility in that neighborhood yes or no is there um, uh, solid waste actually collected from that neighborhood on a weekly or a daily or a monthly basis yes or no these are all neighborhood neighborhood attributes and our assumption was that depending upon the type of uh, solid waste facilities uh, such as how much and how often the waste is collected it may have a bearing on how much waste is generated right? and the way to figure this out is to run a regression model and again in the, in the latter, latter half of this, pay, this uh, course um, we will show you how to run regression models and, and as far as the documentation is concerned it has the same uh, traditional thesis format the, the thesis has an abstract then an introduction, a literature review, a research methodology, and then a discussion about data collection, data analysis, discussion of results, conclusions, references, appendices, and that's it. So now we have just done the, the uh, discussion on research methodology. We have completed the discussion. And in the next uh, phase of this lecture, we will actually discuss the results and findings from that research. And now you will see how research methodology was applied, certain results were drawn, and some how results were presented uh, in this section. So let's first look at Raul Pindi City. And here, the graphic you see on the on the on your screen uh, is 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 a map of uh, Raul Pindi City. And um, if I were to uh, um, show this this line here, the blue line. Is in fact um, sort of a boundary between Rawalpindi City and Rawalpindi Cantonment, and you would see that the the, the map it has a third dimension or the elevation, and the elevation is basically showing you the population density at the neighborhood level. Um, the the student actually got this data from Population Census Organization, and the data from Population Census Organization was used um, to to first digitize a map uh, of of Rawalpindi City. And then after digitizing the map, uh, co taking the uh, neighborhood level data and creating this uh, population density map. And you would notice that in certain parts of the city, the population density is as high as 100,000 persons per square kilometer, which is um, in, in global terms, very, very high density. Um, consider, for example, in, in, in a city like Toronto, the high density would be 15,000 persons per square kilometer. And that would be a very high density, but here, we have um, densities reaching 100,000. In cities like Mumbai, uh, the, the population density is even higher in certain neighborhoods. Now, uh, one thing to note is that uh, um, after we have looked at the population density, we look at the household size, um, that is average number of persons living uh, within a neighborhood. And you would see that there is a fair deal of distribution. Not all city, or not all parts of Rawalpindi have the same number of uh, persons and you would notice that this area and I'm, I'm just going to highlight this area right here uh, this area has um, considerably higher household sizes in excess of seven to from seven to ten persons per household and in in this area and to give you some some relevance this is Peshawar Road running like this and this here is Murray Road running like this and this touches Peshawar Road here this becomes the mall and therefore, you see that in, in this part of the city, in Peshawar, uh, in Rawalpindi city, you have very high um, average household sizes. Right? And again, I'm using the word average, which is a, uh, a central uh, tendency, a measure of central tendency. So, if you look at the, uh, the male to female ratio, uh, Rawalpindi being a garrison city, you would notice that there are certain neighborhoods where uh, the male to female ratio is extremely high where you have 1.5 males or more for every female so these are the very high male dominated areas in the city and if you were to look at the the distribution of literacy and here what we have plotted is the uh, 
um, 10 plus years of education um, uh, and number of uh, individuals who have a percentage of adults who have 10 plus years of education and you would see that the the darker the shade the lower the literacy rate and this the same neighborhoods that I already identified as very high household size you would notice that this very high household size neighborhoods also have uh, poor literacy uh, ratios now this is why we are, I'm showing you these maps and why they are part of this research is basically to understand the basic uh, socio demographics of the city that you're trying to analyze and one has to have the global macro picture before you get into analyzing micro level neighborhood level or household level characteristics and this is a rather more involved graphic but this map shows you uh, that in neighborhoods where you have informal housing and informal housing is uh, what we call in Pakistan the kacha housing uh, informal housing is, is basically a sort of a proxy for low income households you would see that female uh, literacy rates are very uh, com compared to males are significantly low in, in low income housing and again this neighborhood has that example in areas where you have sort of affluence you would see that a higher level of literacy is available for females a younger children a younger um, uh, child female child than male child and this is an example of this neighborhood is an example of the, uh, this tendency that I've been showing you now uh, because the project is about uh, water uh, sanitation and, 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 a, and a related measure of uh, services is the water supply and you would notice that the water supply is, is uh, in the cantonment area and the garrison part of the city is fairly poor because of the, the, the uh, lack of uh, portable water which is which is which is visible in these areas and the city in general has fairly better uh, water supply at least according to the census information and if you look at the the correlation between water supply and uh, uh, and uh, income uh, proxies for income you would notice that this these are the neighborhoods that have very um, high level of uh, formal housing so a large number of housing units are formal suggesting that this is high income neighborhoods but they have poor water supply so uh, this leads us to conclude that in Rawalpindi water supply is not an issue of income it's just that water is scarce in the city and access to sanitation again you would see that the the darker shade air neighborhoods like this neighborhood here um, is a neighborhood with uh, poor sanitation level uh, and you would see that um, the, these neighborhoods and I'm just going to draw a boundary around these neighborhoods these neighborhoods are the ones with relatively poor sanitation and if you can recall this was the neighborhood where you had um, low income households uh, larger household sizes and you can see the sanitation is also poor so this is one way and the, the, the maps that you are seeing were generated using geographic information systems GIS which is a fairly efficient way of looking at uh, georeference data where you can actually plot large amounts of data as maps and this presents a pictorial view of your data you could see the same you could try to visualize the same in a tabular format but these are four, uh, a table of 400 rows and a, a map would be a very um, explicit depiction of the underlying uh, trends and a table would be would, would be would be hiding a lot of these trends and it would be not possible to view that just by eyeballing it and if you see that uh, the the water supply is better in in in, in the Raul Pindi city and uh, I have plotted the water supply in city and the cantonment areas you see that water supply is better in the city not in the cantonment and the sanitation is slightly better in the garrison area uh, compared to the city and there's no difference in power supply and, and the percentage of formal housing now what I have just presented in, in maps is, is the global picture it's, it's the macro picture of uh, water supply sanitation and the underlying demographics and that sets the tone for your survey results because you now understand what what are the macro dimensions what is happening at the macro level and then you move from there to the local level so from, from this we move to the actual survey and I will show you the results 
that were obtained from the household survey and the waste survey that was conducted by the student. So let's look at this table. Um, you have six neighborhoods and the names of the neighborhoods are uh, spelled out here, right? And those neighborhoods are, uh, these two first two neighborhoods are low income neighborhoods. The next two are medium income neighborhoods and the following are the, the high income neighborhoods. The number of neighborhoods uh, after we had cleaned the data set uh, were uh, 118 and for each neighborhood we had these numbers of households. 20 households in this neighborhood of Fazlabad and 20 in Nasirabad but in this neighborhood of Nisar Road with just 19 uh, uh, observations. We lost one household because of uh, data issues. And I'm also reporting percentage and you would see that on average each neighborhood is contributing roughly 17% of the observations in our data set. And here I'm reporting cumulative uh, percentages, so 16% or 17% plus 17 becomes almost 34% plus 16, 50% and this is the cumulative percentage uh, reported in the last column. So you would notice the first thing I have presented to you is the number of observations recorded in each household and that's where you actually start with descriptive analysis. You see how many observations were collected from what neighborhood and of what type of information was collected. So um, the next table presents number of children per household and here you see the word mean and mean or average is that um, uh, it's a measure of central tendency and if you notice that in the low-income neighborhood of Faslabad the average number of children per household are 2.8 right and in the high-income neighborhood of Valley Road the average number of children is 1.9 so you could see that this uh, high-income neighborhood on average has at almost one child less on average than the other uh, than the low-income neighborhood now what I have here is something called the standard deviation and I will skip uh, the discussion on standard deviation because this is, is slightly advanced at this stage. This is a measure of variance in your data set and um, I think at this very stage let's not discuss standard deviation and just focus on uh, measures of central tendency. So I hope that the, the, the table conveys this picture that uh, if you compare the low income versus high income neighborhoods you would see that at least in one instance of high income neighborhood the average number of children is less significantly less than the, the low income uh, neighborhood and if you look at housing tenure and housing tenure means um, ownership uh, do you own or rent and that's called housing tenure you would notice that low income neighborhoods have uh, ownership rates housing ownership rates much lower than high income neighborhoods uh, for example uh, this neighborhood of Fazlabad 45% households owned their homes and 55% rented their homes whereas uh, in the high income neighborhoods you have 80% percentage 80% of the households owning their homes and only uh, roughly 20% were renting right so you had the count information uh, and then I would transform this information to percentages because that would be more illustrative uh, in this case because when you are comparing what percentage of people are owning and renting the actual counts are not that illustrative but con converting that into percentages you can actually have a much more meaningful um, dialogue so look at this neighborhood here which is of PIA colony and in this neighborhood in our sample in this neighborhood 100% of the households were um, owning their homes then um, the another uh, because in this uh, questionnaire we did not ask for household income I think it is very difficult to, to, to get information on this people do not readily reveal uh, household income regardless of who is conducting the survey so the the tendency is to use proxies on income and, and the proxies you use are um, size of the housing unit number of cars uh, owned by the household number of uh, uh, you know, how many stories, how many bedrooms, so on and so forth and then you can impute a sort of uh, income uh, uh, levels from there. So what I have presented here is, is a table um, in which the average size of the housing unit is presented and you would see that there's a great degree of variation 
the average size of the housing unit in the high income neighborhoods is over 6,000 square feet and the average size in the low income neighborhood is around um, 1,000 square feet and in the mid income neighborhoods is around it varies between 1,500 to 1,800 square feet and again re remember that the, the, the number I'm quoting these are averages from the data set. Moving forward um, if you look at the source of water supply, uh, how these households in six different neighborhoods uh, get water, um, you would notice that the uh, municipal water supply is either available to uh, very low income neighborhood or very high income neighborhoods. And in the mid income neighborhood category, no municipal water supply is available. Right? And that's something very interesting and you can then see um, that um, in the mid-income neighborhoods um, it's the pumping pumped water from uh, from uh, drilling um, that is serving these neighborhoods uh, to the, and roughly 88 percent in one neighborhood and 82 percent in another neighborhood are, are getting their water supply from drilling drilling uh, uh, and pumping water from from the from the water table from the groundwater and again um, I am presenting these in percentages and then these percentages are in fact the average percentages uh, average percentage or what percentage of the people on average are getting water from what source and this uh, the alternatives for municipal tap water uh, hand pump uh, drilling boring pump um, or buying water through water tank and so on and so forth so moving further how waste is disposed you would notice that the data here is not in, in um, here you would see that uh, um, a large number of households in the low income neighborhoods reported saying that no facility was available um, that is 57 percent in one neighborhood but if you look at the high income neighborhood uh, very interesting that 80 plus 82 percent in one neighborhood and 65 percent in the other neighborhood reported a rubbish bin being available so this is very illustrative when you do your research. You can actually look at how services are provided. And you would notice that in the mid-income neighborhoods, no rubbish bins are provided by the municipal authorities. And in the low-income neighborhoods, only 7 or 6% of the households are reported having access to a rubbish bin, whereas uh, most of the low- and mid-income neighborhood dwellers were, in fact, disposing their waste on empty lots within the same neighborhood. In one instance, uh, it was 88%. In another, it was 70%. So this is how we actually do descriptive analysis. We look at the basic uh, demographic characteristics and basic uh, uh, behavioral characteristics. And in this case, we are interested in municipal services. Solid waste is a uh, variable of interest. And we could see how uh, different neighborhoods have different characteristics when it comes to uh, the disposal of waste. So in low-income neighborhoods, Waste is being disposed on empty lots and, and properties owned by the government, but nobody's there. And then um, in, in two instances, in low-income neighborhoods, people are saying that there is absolutely no facility available. But in high-income neighborhoods, you see some facilities available. And the last thing that I will present today uh, in this lecture is the recycling behavior. Um, how these households across the six neighborhoods recycle their material, and you would see that um, in in the lowest income neighborhoods, a hundred percent of the you know, the solid wa uh, the recyclable waste is sold to the junk collectors, and and and, and only twenty five percent or less uh, in the high income neighborhoods where the solid waste is sold to the junk collectors. And I will uh, in this lecture stop at this slide um, um, just to to recap what we have learned so far. Um, we have taken a study of solid waste generation and we have walked through the entire study. We have started with the um, focus, uh, we started with the research methodology, how would this research be conducted, uh, what, is, what is the research question, why are we studying it, is it worthwhile to study solid waste generation rates, if it's worthwhile what are the real questions and how would we collect information, uh, what type of literature or previous research has to be studied and um, uh, what methods and tools would be applied to analyze the collected information. And in this uh, lecture, what I have shown you is uh, the descriptive statistics uh, that are the first output, the initial output from any research 
which is descriptive statistics and I've shown you uh, both for demographics and uh, matters related to uh, municipal services such as water supply and sanitation. I've also shown you uh, slides uh, containing maps using the geographic information systems where you use the GIS to plot information that is uh, georeferenced so that you can see spatial trends in, in your data set and you can actually use that information coming from a map to learn more about the, the behavior. So this ends our second lecture and we'll discuss more of the results from the survey in our third lecture. Thank you.